Welcome to the Plant Free MD podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the Carnivore Market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products that will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, check it out using my discount code ANTHONY to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25%. All right. Hello, everyone. It's uh, Dr. Chafee. I'm here again with another episode of the Plant Free MD and here with another Plant Free MD, Dr. Jamie Seaman. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Seaman. It's so wonderful to be here. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Well, it's it's great to see you again. Um, I was on your podcast some months ago, and I'm glad to to have the opportunity to, to have you on mine. So thank you very much. The same, the same. Yeah. So um, for people who haven't come across you, can you just give us a brief uh, introduction of yourself and and what you do? Yeah. So I work in my everyday life as an OBGYN. So I deliver babies. I do gynecology surgery, which is like hysterectomies, pelvic floor incontinence um, surgeries. And I really take care of women across their whole lifespan. So, you know, I see everything from teenage girls to um, very postmenopausal women. But a little bit about my story is I grew up in the middle of the United States. So in Nebraska, like in the, the, the cornfields of the middle of the United States. And I was an athlete and I played college softball for the university of Nebraska. And I pursued a degree in nutrition and exercise science while I was there. And, um, you know, so I don't want to say I was like forced to work out and, uh, you know, but, but I was, and after medical school or after uh, college, I went to medical school. I met my husband, got married, went to medical school. And this was this first kind of time in my life where all of a sudden I was going from being very physically active to being very sedentary. I'm sitting in the classroom for long periods of time. I'm sitting in the library for long periods of time. And it was kind of the first time in my life where if I wanted to work out, like I had to figure out what to do on my own. <laughs> so I went through actually a little stint with like P90X, but, um, this was the first time that I started to struggle with my weight and I had this degree in nutrition and all I knew was to count calories and eat low fat. So in medical school, I was literally sitting in the library, like counting pretzels, counting goldfish crackers, and just trying to stay on this calorie restricted diet. And I mean, it works. It, I mean, it, it works to a degree if you, you know, restrict it. And then we decided to start a family. So I got pregnant in medical school with my oldest daughter and failed my glucose testing, had like a eight pound, two ounce baby, my first pregnancy. And then right after she was born, I felt horrible. And I was diagnosed with postpartum hypothyroidism. And, um, during that pregnancy, I did exercise, but I mean, I will fully admit like my diet was, uh, (laughs) I mean, not that great. And then I had two more pregnancies during residency. And once again, failed my glucose testing. Uh, my other girls were eight fifteen and eight pounds, 13 ounces. So good size babies. And, uh, after my third daughter was born, I had a real bad tragedy happen in my life. I lost one of my best friends in the middle of her pregnancy and, um, was diagnosed with pre-diabetes around that time. And it was just this very pivotal moment in my life where, I decided that I had to live my life very differently. You know, I feel like as physicians, we really need to be like the billboard of what health looks like. And so many doctors are not that. And for me, that just didn't sit well with my soul. So in 2015, I set out on trying to fix my nutrition. I had this nutrition degree and a medical degree. Like you would think I knew exactly what I was supposed to eat, but I didn't. And I started with kind of a whole 30 diet. So right. Whole foods. That sounds like a no brainer. And then I went to paleo and then I kind of settled on the ketogenic diet. And then there was evolutions of my diet in 2018. I really started to eat more carnivore and, um, my own health journey, my prediabetes is long gone. I'm not on thyroid medication. I started lifting weights again in 2018. I mean, my health is the best it's ever been in my adult life, but what started is really changing my nutrition really changed every aspect of my life. It changed the way I parent. It changed me as a wife. It changed the way I practice medicine. 
I went back to fellowship, uh, you know, and, and did additional training in integrative medicine and made, became one of the first board certified ketogenic nutrition specialists in the U S and, you know, I'm really on a, on a path now to change the way that we practice medicine to help more people. Well, that's awesome. I mean, that's, that's a fantastic background. I'm very sorry to hear about your friend. Um, and, uh, that's absolutely tragic, especially during, during a pregnancy. So I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, but it's, you know, amazing that you're, you're, like you say, like one of the first, you know, uh, sort of ketogenic, um, you know, physicians in, in the U S I think that's great that that's even an option for people to, uh, you know, to study more and to, and to further their practice that way. So hopefully that that'll become a bigger thing. Um, and you, do you, do you incorporate this into your, your practice as well as, as, as an OB or is it, is there like a side practice that, that comes up in? Yeah, no, I, I only have one medical practice. I don't do telemedicine, so it's just my face-to-face patients, but I do practice differently than, you know, most OBGYNs. I, every single, you know, new patient that comes in, we talk about their diet. What have you eaten in the last 24 hours? Mm -hmm. We talk about if they're exercising, we talk about how they're sleeping because all of these things are going to give me little tips and kind of ideas about what might be going on, right? They're having cycle dysregulation or they're missing their periods or, you know, whatever it is, I try to connect those things back to, you know, how they're living. And, and, and I think those things have such a more profound impact on outcomes than, you know, traditional medicines and things like that. I practice Western medicine. I write prescriptions. Okay. I write prescriptions for birth control pills. Mm -hmm. These things have a time and a place, but I think for the vast majority of people, if you haven't optimized what I consider to be like the five pillars that I wrote about in my book, if you haven't optimized those things, you're just, I mean, you're, you're trying to throw a bandaid on a situation and it may help you short-term. It's not going to help you long-term. Okay. So, so what are those five pillars that you discuss in your book? Yeah. So I, I wrote a book this last year that came out called hard to kill. And you know, the title of the book, I feel like is very self-explanatory, but, um, when I talked about the, the passing of my friend, you know, she died at age 29. She was, to- she was very healthy. She was a mom of two. She died of a disseminated fungal infection called coccidiomycosis. Mm. And, you know, the doctors actually kind of missed the diagnosis and it was too late. And for me, it was this kind of reckoning with my own mortality that we really don't know how long we have, you know, on this earth. Now, statistically speaking, most people listening to this podcast are going to live into their seventh or eighth decade of life and then something will kill them. And the things that are most likely to kill them are cardiovascular disease, cancer, or some sort of neurologic disease. And so, you know, for me, this kind of hard to kill idea was what are the basic foundational things that I think everybody should, you know, be doing to be hard to kill, knowing that at any moment, when I get off this podcast, something could take me out. And that sounds very like grim, you know, to somebody listening right now, but that's just the reality. You know, you just you just literally don't know. I don't know. There's maybe somebody that knows, but it's not me. Um, so the five pillars, uh, of hard to kill. The first one is nutrition, what we eat. So this is something we do every single day, usually multiple times per day. And when you want to make uh, changes in your life, this is actually something where you can see changes rather quickly. I mean, we see shifts in glucose levels, insulin levels within, you know, a couple of days of initiating a new diet. We see microbiome changes within a week. So this is something that can really impact your health. And when it comes to nutrition and we can, we can come back to this pillar and dive into it and talk more, um, you know, we really need to prioritize protein in the diet for women, um, because they're under eating that we need to prioritize high quality fats. And we have to be really cautious about carbohydrate consumption because it's the one macronutrient, um, that, that there is an upper threshold. That's, that's probably dangerous for most people. Um, the second pillar is exercise or movement. Our bodies were designed to do physically hard things. And we live in a day and age where we drive cars and we have elevators instead of stairs. We can literally Uber eats food, like from our phone straight to our front door. Like we don't have to work hard to do really anything these days. And our bodies were designed to do hard things because it enrich our, you know, muscular system, our, our bone system, it helps our brain work better. And, you know, back in the day, people had to physically hunt for their food. We don't have to do that. So now we have like things called gyms, which is just Mm -hmm. like, you know, crazy, but, um, but in this pillar, we really talk about, you know, movement that 
is going to be the most time effective. You know, I'm a busy mom and professional. I don't have like four hours a day. So, you know, the most bang for your buck is doing resistance training and doing true, like high intensity interval work or sprint work. Um, and women really need to get away from the long bouts of cardio and running and ellipticals because it's really not helping your body composition. It's not making you harder to kill. Um, the third pillar is sleep. And, you know, we think it's just this passive thing. Like we lay down, close our eyes, but sleep really plays an important aspect in our health. Um, our hormonal health, our circadian rhythm is so important. Um, and so, uh, that is its own pillar. The fourth pillar is stress and stress resilience. So understanding how to train is one thing, understanding how to recover from our lives is even more important. So creating resiliency, um, not only physically, um, but mentally and spiritually as well. You know, this, this chapter and pillar kind of talks a lot about mindset, which I think is kind of the magic sauce. You know, most patients can come into my clinic and tell me, oh yeah, I'm supposed to, you know, eat this way and move this way, but who are the people that are successful? And I think it really comes down to their internal uh, language and the language that comes into our brain comes out in action in our life. And so it's, it's really uh, a very pivotal thing that you have to get and you have to understand to make these changes in your life. And then the fifth pillar is, um, I call it environment, but I really describe it as like people, places, and things. So the people you hang out with, um, the people closest to you have an impact on your health. Um, the places you live, like our air quality, water quality, you know, Australia versus Nebraska, very, you know, could be very different. And then the things are, you know, the plastics and, you know, phthalates and endocrine disruptors. And for women, like I read some study on average, we use 30 different chemicals on our body every day. Um, and these are, you know, might seem like little minute things, but if you're really trying to optimize your health and you're really trying to be hard to kill, um, we have to take a survey of, you know, the, the products that we're using and, you know, if they may be contributing or harming our health. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, that's just something that, um, I've, I've sort of heard, heard more and more about people who are going towards, you know, unscented soaps and, and not using all, all the perfume and scents and, and scented uh, lotions and things like that. What are some of those that, that would, um, mess with your endocrine system? Yeah. Well, you know, the one that everybody's heard of is like BPA or bisphenol a, mm -hmm. but the truth is, is that a lot of, you know, anything that, um, and it's not just plastics. People think of like plastic food storage containers, but it's crazy. Now manufacturers are using plastics in our clothing. Mm -hmm. Um, thermal receipt paper is really high in BPA. Um, and these things are easily absorbed through our skin. And with the receipt paper, a really interesting fact is that if you put hand sanitizer on your hands before you touch the thermal receipt paper, um, or after it increases the absorption of the BPA tenfold. And so, you know, then manufacturers pulled BPA out of products, but they're just using, you know, a different BPA They're you know, they're still using these chemicals. And, um, I had, um, uh, somebody on the podcast that, uh, that, that talked about, we had spent an entire podcast talking about this, uh, wrote a book called estrogenation and it's crazy when you look at, for instance, um, in rats, there's a specific chemical, um, that if you infuse it into these rats, hundred percent of them get endometriosis. So it might seem just like this, you hmm. know, kind of one-off thing, but these chemicals really can have a profound, uh, they can create profound problems inside of our bodies. These aren't you know, these are modern day technology that we've created. And in the book, I kind of touch on this too, that, you know, technology is amazing. The fact that you and I are sitting on this computer right now, halfway across the world, talking to each other, like this is awesome, mm -hmm. but it all, everything comes with a trade-off, right? Everything comes with a trade-off cars are awesome, but they, you know, emit exhaust. Um, your water bottle is great. Cause you're going to stay hydrated, but it's maybe leaching chemicals into your water. There's a trade-off for absolutely everything. It's like when I sit down to discuss risks and benefits with people, you know, we, we have to weigh both sides. And, um, so for women in particular, like the cosmetic industry is so unregulated when it comes to what they can put in these products. So, you know, it's, uh, and some these days with social media, everything's coming from China and it's even less mm. regulated, but, but your like your hair products, your cosmetic products that you're putting directly on your skin. Like those, those are really things you have to pay attention to your laundry detergent, you know, that you're washing your clothes in. And then the biggest one for me is like food storage. So really converting everything to like glass or stainless steel, 
um, looking at your cookware, because these are things you use really often um, that really could be doing a lot of damage to your body. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something that, that completely gets overlooked. People don't think about that sort of stuff. There's, you know, some of the, some of the, maybe with the plastics, you know, maybe pla not, not heating things in plastic containers or using plastic water bottles and things like that. But other than that, I think that's where it stops for most people if they even go that far. So definitely, yeah, yeah need to think well, about and it. Well, when it comes to, when it comes to clothes, I uh, shared a study recently on men. If you put enough um, polyester near the testicles of men, you can render them infertile. Um, because it doesn't allow the, the, it doesn't allow the scrotum to, to cool down. Like the mm -hmm. reason that the testicles are away from the body is because they have to cool down, uh, to, uh, create spermatogenesis. And so I shared this study that they basically took this polyester sling and put it around the scrotum and it made hundred percent of these men infertile within a couple months. Now it was completely reversible. They were actually studying it as a male contraception. Uh, yeah. method. But I mean, this is like, this is real world stuff for me, you know, being an obstetrician, like when a couple can't get pregnant, it's like, okay, what kind of underwear is he wearing? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, it really could be making a difference. Yeah. A bunch of sailors are going to go out and get in like polyester underwear now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Take that off. There was um, something my dad was telling me, there was like, there was an area of like these, like, um, you know, nuclear, um, you know, battleships and, and carriers and things like that. And they had these nuclear reactors and, uh, and apparently you could go to like a certain area and, or maybe like radio. So anyway, something admitted like, you know, some low enough frequency sort of radiation and all these guys, whether it worked or not, they apparently did this. They just walked up there and just stood there for like a minute, just irradiated their, all their sperm and everything like that. Then went on shore leave. And they, they use that as like birth, temporary birth control. Birth I'm like, control. That's, that's going to catch up to you. That's, that's, yeah. like, that's going to have some long-term effects. I'm sure. But, uh, um, so speaking about, um, the other pillar on, on nutrition, um, so are you counseling your, your patients? What do you normally counsel them? Is it, is it only for like a keto thing or, or what do you, what do you suggest for your patients? Yeah. So typically what we do when they come in is, uh, we do some baseline lab work and we just say, okay, you know, where is your metabolic health at? So we look at their fasting glucose and insulin levels. We look at their fasted lipid panel, um, specifically looking like at their triglycerides and triglyceride to HDL ratio, not necessarily the LDL, um, as much if there's any, you know, uh, abnormalities, then we may get an advanced lipid panel or like an advanced cardiac panel, looking at some of their other, you know, markers, particle sizes, lipids. A lot of that is for my patients that come to me that are keto carnivore and that have some sort of question from, you know, an outside provider about what's going on. Um, and then, you know, we may look at some, you know, vitamin nutrient things it, it really just depends kind of what their initial complaint is or what, you know, their, their goals are. Um, we never want to order like tons of lab testing that we're not going to use, but I think in a basic sense, you know, we look at what's their blood pressure, you know, what's their, what's their weight or body composition. What do these fasted labs look like? And then we kind of decide, you know, what their goals are and what might be optimal for them. Um, I don't think that everybody needs to be in ketosis. I think that there are people that can eat a low carb diet and do really well. Um, you could even argue on the flip side of that, that there's some people that could probably eat high carb, low fat diets and thrive. I think that number is probably very small, mm -hmm. but, um, but we basically, you know, figure out where they are and, you know, where do we go from here? Um, when we transition people to lower carb diets, um, it's most helpful to titrate the carbs down slowly. Um, because if you go from eating 300 carbs a day to eating 30 carbs per day, um, with the quick reduction in insulin, they can get a lot of electrolyte problems in the first week or two that makes it less likely that they stick with it. Um, so, you know, we kind of go, go slow, we add electrolytes, we work on hydration and, and these other types of things. But I would say for the vast majority of patients, I do recommend what would be by today's standards considered low carb, <laughs> you know, even some of my CrossFit athletes, you know, we're doing you know, maybe a hundred or 150 or something for performance. But for, for most people, it's, it's pretty low carb. And, um, I have carnivore patients as well. Um, you know, that don't eat any plants or carbs and, uh, we, we check their labs and we look at their biomarkers and if they feel good and they're functioning good and the labs look good, then, you know, we continue with the plan. And if it's not, then we, then we change something. Oh, great. And, um, and is that, so is, and that's how you approach all these and, and most of these would be pregnant women. So, um, this is something that, that comes up a lot, you know, is this, is even keto safe for, um, pregnancy is carnivore safe for pregnancy. What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah. I mean, the real answer is we don't know because, you know, we're not going to be able to do a randomized control trial in pregnancy, you know, telling these women to eat a carnivore diet and these women to eat a ketogenic diet and these people to eat a, you know, vegan diet or whatever it is. And so a lot of the data that we have is very observational. Now, when we look at the recommendations for pregnancy, the lower threshold recommendation for carbohydrate consumption in pregnancy is 175 grams, um, which is probably lower than, than some people are eating. Mm -hmm. Um, but the number, uh, isn't really based in science. It is it's somewhat arbitrary in the sense that they've calculated what the kind of like obligatory use of glucose is, uh, by the fetus and by the mom and the fact that the mom's body is growing. And then they kind of look at two standard deviations and that's how they came up with 175. I think that our goal in pregnancy is not only normal glycemia, but normal insulin levels. And let me kind of break this down a little bit. We know from data in the HAPO trials, this was the hyperglycemia uh, adverse outcome trials in pregnancy, that glucose and outcomes like NICU admission, large babies, risk of C-section, risk to your baby long-term, like your baby developing type two diabetes in their lifetime is a linear relationship. It's a linear relationship. The higher the glucose levels, the higher the insulin levels, the more risk there is. Now, obviously as a doctor, I have to pick a cutoff when we're diagnosing something like gestational diabetes to say like, okay, here's the line. You people have a problem. You people don't, but because it's a spectrum, because it's this linear relationship, there's people that get missed, right. That can still, still have problems. And so when it comes to carbohydrate consumption, it's not just normal glucose levels. We want, if a woman comes to me and I have her test her blood sugars and she's eating a, you know, high carbohydrate diet and her numbers look normal. The question I'm always asking myself is at the cost of what amount of insulin, because the pancreas puts out about 30% more insulin in the first trimester of pregnancy, and it develops physiologic insulin resistance from these placental hormones in the third trimester. And the reason that this is a physiologic process is because the body is wanting to make sure that there is a continuous supply of both glucose and fatty acids that are shuttled across the placenta for the baby. And so, you know, really the, the placenta is what I call like team fetus. It's not, you know, if there's adverse problems with the mom too bad, we want to make sure this baby survives. Mm -hmm. And so, um, <laughs> and so what can happen is that, you know, your body will just put out more and more and more and more and more insulin, just like it does outside of pregnancy, um, to, to keep the, the glucose levels, you know, within range, but hyperinsulinemia. So even if your blood sugars look normal, hyperinsulinemia increases the risk of preeclampsia which is, you know, a very, uh, dangerous disorder for pregnant women to get. And we're get, we're seeing it on the rise gestational hypertension of pregnancy. Um, it still increases the risk for large babies, risk of shoulders, so uh, C-sections and, and a lot of risks for your baby long-term because hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia create epigenetic modifications, meaning they actually alter your baby's DNA, turning this, you know, certain genes off and on. And these are inheritable conditions. So basically you know, you're altering your, uh, your family for, for decades and centuries to come, you're altering the DNA. Um, so diet and pregnancy is very important, you know, to say that 175 and no less than that is the recommendation could be causing harm. And in medicine, right. We say do no harm. I think there are patients, you know, I've had gestational diabetic patients that certainly have to eat way less than that to control their blood sugars. And I have patients that come into pregnancies have been, you know, very healthy, doing well on low carb diets, you know, prior to pregnancy. And they ask, can I continue? And when we look at the Institute of Medicine recommendations, they admit in the Institute you know, of Medicine recommendations that if you are eating adequate dietary fat and protein, carbohydrates are non-essential really for life and for pregnancy. Now, does that mean that women should be zero carb? I don't know that that's the answer. Um, you know, I think that we have to be careful about, you know, metabolic stress and physiologic stress in the pregnancy. Um, but I think that there are people that do really well in pregnancy on low carb diets. And, um, you know, I wish we could see more of this published data, um, but it's really observational at this point. I mean, that's just the, the, the real answer. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it's at least interesting, at least they're saying that, you know, that, um, you know, that you don't necessarily need it. And that's, um, you know, it's kind of, it's, uh, yeah, interesting. They said that, you know, it's, it's, it was also, um, I found it interesting. You're talking about the epigenetics and how this can have downstream effects and be inheritable. I, I just randomly recently saw a uh, video on some 
uh, research done, I think it's like in the twenties and thirties, it was called Pottinger's cats. And this guy was doing research on cats and like actually exploring TB and he wanted to like take out their adrenals. They thought there was, you know, people that had like adrenal issues were more susceptible to tuberculosis. So he was doing this in cats. And he found that the cats that they were feeding, like cooked meat to just, just meat, um, weren't really surviving these surgeries, uh, these adrenalectomies. And, but the ones that were having, uh, just raw meat, were doing fine and they were doing very well and they were healthier in other metrics. So we actually switched the course of his entire research and just started studying um, the, the effect of these nu you know, nutrition on these cats and just had cats just eating cooked meat and just eating raw meat. And they found that the ones eating cooked meat were not he healthier for a lot of different reasons, but then the next generation, they were physically structurally different. They were generally smaller in stature, their brains and their, their um, psychomatic arch weren't completely formed. And, uh, and the bone mineral density or bone mineral, um, percentage was, was actually much lower as a like half of what they would normally see. And then in the third generation, it was even worse. And I think they had only had like 3% uh, bone mineralization in the third generation of the just cooked meat. It was still meat, it was just cooked meat. And um, and, they, and the bones were like almost spongy, like foam rubber, rubber, and they had all these fractures and breaks. And, and at, at, after that point, they were sterile. Um, and they, they couldn't, uh, they either couldn't procreate or, the, or they had stillbirth. And um, they said that they could reverse that by putting them back onto a, a raw meat diet, but they found it took four generations to, to mm. get them back to where just the, the raw food, um, cats were at this, at, you know, at the beginning. So I thought that was very, yeah. very interesting. And it just sort of demonstrates the effects of, of these knock-on effects that, that you were describing. Yeah. I think it's fascinating. I mean, I think our bodies are, uh, they're a, a brilliant species. They're always trying to adapt you know, to our environment and our stressors and things like that. But, um, there there's real world ramifications of these things for, mm. for generations to come. I mean, it's not just like, Oh, grandma had diabetes and you know, that was her story. It's, I mean, <laughs> your, your DNA is, but the, but the other caveat with that, that I want to say is that, um, we are finding that epigenetic modifications probably matter more than your, your DNA written code. So the good news is that you, you have a lot of power, you know, the person listening right now, like just because your mom smoked and drank and ate Cheetos her whole pregnancy, like doesn't mean you're doomed. Um, you yourself have, you know, the power to turn these switches off and on and, um, and, and that will matter for your, for your children. So you're not just doomed, but, uh, they do have a profound impact on, on your health. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> And so have you, have you noticed that, um, these dietary changes can affect, um, like female hormones and fertility, uh, as well? Well, infertility is a growing problem, um, in the, in the country and really across the world. Um, you know, sperm is getting worse than men. Women are having a lot more ovulatory dysfunction. Another reason for infertility is, um, the ovaries in women basically determine the rate at which we age. And so if we do things in our life, you know, like develop insulin resistance or smoke or whatever it is, um, we can accelerate the aging of the ovary. And so we get poor egg quality, poor egg quantity, um, and a lot of hormonal problems, you know, that can occur. And so, um, infertility is, is a tough one because it's sometimes it's male-based and sometimes it's female-based, but I think that nutrition does have a profound impact on, on fertility and the ability to reproduce because we have these nutrient sensing pathways in our body that are, they're a requisite for life, right? So as women, as a reproductive species, our body, every single month, when we go through our menstrual cycle is saying, is this a good time to reproduce? And if it senses in any way that there is some sort of perceived stress, now it doesn't know if your boss yelled at you or if you're <laughs> not eating enough B12, right? The cell just says I'm stressed. And then it will, you know, send these signals that you maybe won't ovulate. It won't create the endometrial lining, how it's supposed to, there will be problems that, that won't allow you to get pregnant. And so that's why, you know, we say like the menstrual, the menstrual cycle is like a vital sign. Right. Um, and so nutrition is important when we think about what nutrients are required to get pregnant and to grow another human, you know, we kind of touched on this idea that carbohydrates are probably you know, non-essential, we can make enough carbohydrates from protein and fat substrates. Now, I also said, you know, is zero the answer? I don't know, probably not. But um, when it comes to protein, 
um, the minimum threshold for a pregnancy uh, by the Institute of Medicine is like, uh, you know, 80, 90 grams, which is incredibly low when you think about the protein requirements required in pregnancy. And so if you come into pregnancy, not eating a lot of meat and protein, um, and then suddenly having to increase <laughs> the first trimester is brutal. So, uh, you know, I find that most women, even my carnivore patients in the first yeah. trimester, it is like, they're like, Oh my gosh, like I'm choking down, <laughs> you know, this meat. Um, and then fat, and it's the type of fat we're eating. We need, you know, really high quality fats. We need things like eggs. Um, you can even eat organ meats, like small amounts of liver, but, um, you know, we need butter, we need seafood. We need these, these foods contain, uh, the right nutrients for a healthy pregnancy. And when you tell a woman to eat 175 grams of carbohydrates, it becomes mathematically and statistically impossible to get the amount of vitamin D and choline and iron and these other very, very, very essential things in pregnancy. Um, and so, you know, that's where people who are wanting to get pregnant have to be, you know, really cautious when you're eating something like a lot of wheat and grains, you know, they, they don't contain all the right nutrients you need and they come at the cost of a lot of calories. And so that's why I'm kind of saying it becomes mathematically statistically impossible because you're going to have to eat a lot of calories to get that amount of nutrients. And, um, it can come with, with, um, side effects. Yeah. Well, and that, yeah. And that, that makes perfect sense. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to get, meet certain, certain thresholds with your, your protein and fat, and you're trying to pack in 175 grams of carbs, I think, yeah, you know, something's got to give, um, and it could be your waistline, you know? And so, yeah. um, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. I mean, even if you're just eating, you know, let's say you're eating fruits, vegetables, and, you know, a little bit of quinoa or something like that, like that's it, you would still like without eating processed carbohydrates, like you're probably not going to hit 175, you know, just eating mm -hmm. blueberries and, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, these people are eating processed carbs and wheat thins and goldfish crackers and bread and pasta and, you know, all of these things. And in, in pregnancy, you know, it's kind of a myth that you need, uh, to eat for two, the caloric increase in pregnancy is maybe hundred calories in the first trimester, 200 in the second and 300 in the third. I mean, that is a snack that is not, yeah. you know, and then in lactation breastfeeding, maybe about 500 calories. Um, and so it's really not that much more calories per se. And so, you know, we don't want to encourage women. We'll just eat more, eat more, eat more, uh, because that increases her risk for a lot of things like gestational diabetes and high blood pressure. So you want to be eating nutrient dense foods. And when we say, what are the most nutrient dense foods? They are animal foods and yeah. they are the most bioavailable form, you know, that's easily absorbed and easily utilized in the body. Yeah, absolutely. My mom, I just think about when you were talking about, you know, birth, birth weights uh, and things like that. I remember just all my siblings, there's five of us. We were all like nine pounds, eight ounces. My brother was 10 pounds even. Uh, my mom's five, two. She's this tiny little thing. Oh my God. Yeah, it was, it was no, <laughs> there was no way that was happening. So like we were all C-sections, all five of us uh, were cesarean. And so, um, yeah. And we just, yeah. We just yeah and I'm not saying, I mean, I'm maybe genetically, I mean, I'm not a small person. I'm, you know, like five, nine, my husband's six, two. I mean, maybe genetically I was supposed to make an eight pound, 15 ounce baby. Uh, my suspicion though, is that my one hour glucose test was over 200 <laughs> and that baby came out. Uh, I mean, she was like a bowling ball. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that's the thing is, you know, when we talk about, um, excessive fetal growth or growth restriction, even, you know, the, the real question is looking at this baby, is this baby meeting its growth potential? Is this baby the, the size it's supposed to be genetically, or is this due to an insufficiency of nutrients or blood flow to the placenta? or over overfed with nutrients, uh, you know, from the, from the placenta. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Um, and then do you see, have you, I don't know if you check hormones and things like that. I presumably do in, in, um, in, at least in fertility, uh, side of things, what have you noticed, um, when, when people go, change their diet dramatically, maybe go keto, maybe go carnivore, are you seeing dramatic changes in, or any changes in their hormonal health? Yeah. So Checking hormones is hard because every day of the month, the hormone levels are going to be different from mm. month to month. They're going to be different from hour to hour. They're going to be different. So mm. tracking, you know, hormones by, by blood work is uh, a little bit nuanced there, right? Mm -hmm. We have to interpret it where you're at the menstrual cycle from a fertility perspective. There's a few points in the menstrual cycle that we like to check. We typically check them around cycle day three. 
So around cycle day three, we're looking at FSH and LH um, because if the FSH is real high, um, it could indicate maybe some ovarian insufficiency or premature menopause. Um, if the LH to FSH ratio is abnormal, it could indicate something like PCOS. And then we're looking at estradiol production. So, um, you know, is the estrogen really low? I've seen that on people eating really low fat diets um, or, or eating vegan or vegetarian diets that are really high in plant-based fiber material. Um, there are actually studies on this that you can eat enough fiber to um, create infertility because you drive your estrogen so low. Um, but, but fiber is so <laughs> vital. It's just this vital nutrient that's just so important. Yeah. <laughs> God, yeah. Hey, mean, like I said, there's a trade-off for everything. So, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and so, yeah, so we look at estrogen. Um, I, I like to look at thyroid, uh, especially for somebody who's wanting to get pregnant. It's, that's not a recommendation by governing societies to check that, but I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, you can't look at progesterone until you get into luteal phase. So the other time of the cycle, I like to look at, um, hormonal production is luteal phase, which is after ovulation, usually around cycle day 21 to see if, corpus luteum is producing enough progesterone to support a pregnancy. Now, all these sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, um, are all made from something called pregnenolone, which comes from cholesterol. So all of our sex hormones are made from cholesterol. So you want, you know, healthy amounts of, of cholesterol in the system and, um, we can eat that and our liver can also make that. Um, but I would say when we, when we see dietary changes, it kind of depends, you know, where they were starting from, you know, a patient with PCOS that I place on a ketogenic diet, we see amazing improvements in their LH to FSH ratio, normalization of estrogen levels, normalization of testosterone levels. Um, their glucose comes down, their insulin comes down, their lipid panel, their blood pressure, all things improve, um, in those types of patients, um, in patients with like unexplained infertility, those are a lot harder, you know? Um, and I think there's probably things we don't know about the microbiome and things like that, that I think could be at play. I did a whole, uh, podcast with a dentist talking about the oral microbiome and its association with pregnancy loss and things like that. Um, which once again is involved with diet. There's four bacteria in your mouth that can cause really bad pregnancy adverse outcomes. And they're all fed by carbohydrates. Mm. Um, oh. there's one that's not, there's one that's not. Um, and so, you know, I think that, um, your hormones can be affected by your diet. Now, every woman comes into my office and they're like, I want to balance my hormones. <laughs> I like, yeah. it's like, it's like nails on a chalkboard for me <laughs> <laughs> because if you, through these nutrient sensing pathways, if you sleep well and eat well and don't over-exercise and know how to understand and deal with stress, you know, take care of your autonomic nervous system, your body will naturally balance your hormones. Uh, it will do that. And it will tell you that because you're going to have a normal menstrual cycle. You're not going to have infertility. Like that is a sign that you're doing something right. And so there's no way to magically manipulate these hormones. There's, there's too many inputs happening, you know, into it. But I do think that diet, you know, has an effect that, um, you know, it, it can change your, it can change your hormone levels. And, and you should know that by, by tracking your cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, and you know, just talking about the oral biome and, and you mentioned the microbiome as well. Um, do you, do you know much about that and, and how that affects and in, in keto and carnivore and things like that? It's something that uh, people ask quite a lot actually about uh, the microbiome. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I think we're still finding out a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, uh, the bacteria that I was talking about in particular, so they're, uh, there is a panel you can, or I don't do a lot of microbiome testing. It's not a, a usual part of my practice. I'll do some GI mapping and things like that, but I just think there's so much we don't know yet that clinically, I don't know, you know, how relevant it is, but we do know that with dietary changes, there is a shift in the microbiome in like less than seven days. So it's actually very quick that this happens. And, um, you know, what is the most ideal, you know, bacteria to have? I don't, I think that's different for all of us. Um, it's kind of, like I said, these epigenetic modifications, your bacteria are, are constantly trying to, to shift and adapt based on what you're doing. And most people are, are pouring a lot of things down the hatch that are destroying good gut bacteria. They're letting the bad bacteria flourish and it's causing, you know, a lot of problems. We're actually more bacteria than we are human. <laughs> if you, if you really want to be honest. Yeah. And when it comes to fertility, um, like I said, there are particular bacteria that can live basically, you know, everyone talks about the gut, but everything that's down in the gut started in the mouth. So, um, 
you know, if you have poor dent, it's, and it's one thing I look at when I'm talking to a patient, you know, as they're talking, I'm looking at their teeth and their gums. If they don't have a healthy looking mouth, I can already tell you they've got gut problems. They've got other chronic problems. Um, it's a really easy thing to assess. And, you know, dentistry is a modern profession. <laughs> um, people back in the day, I mean, everybody knows, you know, Weston price and the work that he did, like these people didn't have teeth problems. And these days, right. We're going every six months, get our teeth cleaned. Kids are having cavities. We're having to pull teeth and do all this crazy stuff. But when it comes to fertility, um, there's a handful of bacteria that we know if we do saliva testing and you have them in your mouth, they increase your risk for stillbirth, first trimester pregnancy loss, preeclampsia, um, all these adverse pregnancy outcomes, which, um, right. It's like, okay, how can this bacteria in your mouth cause those problems down in your uterus? Well, it's because everything starts in your mouth and babies are born through the vagina, which is right next to your rectum and urethra. And it's by purpose. It is by purpose that your baby comes out of the vagina because the skin bacteria, the bacteria it gets in its mouth from breastfeeding and from being born through the birth canal, um, is important for our health. <laughs> so, um, it's crazy to think that. And some people might be like, Ooh, you know, that's gross or whatever, <laughs> but like, that's where we, we were all born, you know, one way or another. And we know that the difference between a vaginal birth and a C-section birth, these babies have very different bacteria hmm. on their skin and in their guts. And so, um, you know, it, the bacteria is, is a big deal. And we're going to find out so much in the next, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 years about, about the microbiome and the testing's getting better and better and better. Um, I it's, it's fascinating. I actually have a bacteria in my mouth that some carnivore people can have called fusobacterium nucleatum. It's not fed by carbohydrates. And so I'm now I'm on a personal mission to figure out how to get this out of my mouth, but, um, yeah, we're not, we're not perfect. I'm human yeah. over here. So, yeah. I don't know, just mouthwash with Everclear or something like that. Just scorch the <laughs> earth and start over. No, I gave up alcohol October 1st. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah. spit, switch and spit, you know? Just oh, switch and spit. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, I'm actually using um, uh, xylitol. So xylitol mm. actually, um, uh, there's some, I can't, I won't be able to spout off all the research on xylitol, but there was a study that came out that if women choose xylitol gum, it decreased their risk of preterm birth. So I started digging into this research and it's because the bacteria in the mouth will, that like carbohydrates will eat the xylitol, but then it kills them. Oh. So xylitol is amazing for the oral microbiome and you can get xylitol lozenges. You can get gums. They make xylitol toothpaste. They make xylitol mouthwashes, which are way safer than traditional mouthwashes with alcohol that kill the good bacteria. Hmm. Um, so I'm using a combination of xylitol and then some other good bacteria, um, like lactobacillus ruteri, and it can crowd out that bad bacteria uh, within 30 to 60 days is what the dentists are telling me. So very cool. Yeah. 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 Like, a, uh, you know, just about the, you know, the oral biome going into the mic, you know, getting into the intestines and things like that, and then being seeded from your mother and birth, uh, mm -hmm. just, just reminded me of, um, not, not very appealing, but like koalas and, and gorillas, like when <laughs> they can't really digest these, this plant material very well, and especially the, the baby koalas and the, their guts aren't developed properly. It might be part to do with the, the microbiome as well. So they, they eat, um, you know, pre-digested, uh, plant material, AKA feces, they call it fecal pap. And so they're actually eating this stuff. And that, that's something that the babies can actually absorb this partially digested eucalyptus pulp and, um, probably, you know, getting all the, the bacteria Well, they will be getting all the bacteria as well. So yeah, that's, it's funny to think about. And that. what's crazy too, is that when you think about, you know, so the baby's born, right. And it's inoculated with, with all of this bacteria on their skin. Um, the baby's stomach, the pH of the stomach does, does not become really acidic until a couple of days after birth. So when the mom <laughs> is making this low volume colostrum, um, and breastfeeding, that allows this bacteria to get past what would normally be mm. a really acidic stomach and to populate the small intestine and large intestine. And then after a couple of days, the acidity starts to rise, her milk starts to come in. Um, but, but the, the breast milk is actually putting a lot of immunoglobulins and things down there that help establish a normal, healthy microbiome. And I, I get it that, it, you know, fed babies are best, but breast milk is the most optimal thing, you know, from a health perspective for your baby. So everything we can do to even donor milk and things like that, I think are amazing. We're seeing more milk banks in our communities, but that's one thing you can do to establish your baby's microbiome from the get-go. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. And yeah, and like you say, obviously, you know, babies just need to eat and eating something is better than nothing. Um, what are your thoughts on formula, though? I, I, I think that, um, well, I've, I've seen some studies that, that would suggest that actually there's, there's, a, there's a higher prevalence, even in like uh, things like autism in babies that are that are uh, bottle fed and uh, formula fed as opposed to breastfed as well. What are your, your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our formulas in the U S are, are not great. Uh, (laughs) when you look at the ingredients, I mean, corn syrup, solids and things like that. I mean, it's no, no different than some of the processed foods that we're eating. And then we wonder, you know, why formula fed babies have higher rates of, of these problems. And so, um, when I had my girls, I, um, had some trouble with supply. I mean, I only had four weeks of maternity leave. So, you know, I was pumping in bathroom stalls. And I had low supply after about like nine to 10 months. Hmm. And so I had to start supplementing. And so I started looking, you know, at like, Oh, what can I supplement with? And I ended up getting, um, some products from Europe because I felt like they were more superior to then, you know, what I could find here in the U S and people send me DMS all the time asking for recommendations. And I'm not a pediatrician and it's been a long time (laughs) since I had to feed my babies. But, um, I do think that, you know, there, there's no replacement for breast milk. Like I said, these, um, donor banks, uh, where you can, I mean, there's women that are like hyper lactating that, you know, like a milk cow. I mean, they (laughs) they donate to these NICU babies and things like that, which I think is so important. You know, Mm. when you think about a baby that ends up in the neonatal intensive care unit, um, a critically ill baby, you know, that's even more important, right? Their nutrition, their microbiome and those types of things. And so, um, whatever we can do to support those people. Um, you know, I know during the formula crunch of, of during the pandemic, you know, people were like trying to make their own formulas. I'm sure there's a way I'm just not a pediatric nutritionist by any means, but, um, you know, certainly what's good for us is good for our babies too. Yeah. You would, you would imagine, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then you just recently finished a fitness competition as well, which uh, I saw just through your Instagram stories went very well. Can you uh, tell us about that? Yeah. So I, uh, I've taken care of people that have competed in the bodybuilding world. I've always had a very negative, viewed it through a very negative lens because, you know, we look at these people on social media and we think that that's what healthy looks like. And the unfortunate part is that that level of body fat is probably not healthy, especially for women. So I've always viewed it through a very negative lens. I just want to throw that out there. Um, my husband wanted to compete for the first time in 2020 and prepped for a competition. The pandemic hit, he couldn't compete. Um, but it was amazing watching him do this. It was like, it seemed really easy to him. And he said that he actually enjoyed the fact that he didn't have to make decisions every day. Like it was like, he was like, I'm going to eat this. I'm going to train this way. And it took less stress off of him. I'm like, okay, that's kind of interesting. And he was being coached by Robert Sykes at the time, which he wrote an amazing book, um, on, on natural bodybuilding and doing it with a ketogenic approach. So I, my science geek brain was thinking, you know, maybe that maybe there is an approach that's healthy because I take care of so many women who competed and their thyroids are ruined, their estrogens in the tank. They, they just have all of these problems. And I think they have a lot of disordered eating patterns. And, uh, so I tested labs on my husband when he recompeted again in 2021. And it was amazing. He like maintained his testosterone levels, like everything really looked good. So in, uh, 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 or sorry. And so then last year in 2021, I decided to, or this year in 2022, I decided to compete and checked labs on myself. And I just, I just wanted to experience it. I wasn't doing it because I want to be a, you know, professional bodybuilder, but I wanted to experience it. I think you can learn a lot about yourself going through, um, something that requires an intense amount of discipline. Um, and it was a great experience. I mean, I love competing I'm like you, I'm a former athlete, so it's fun to compete. And I don't get to do that a lot in my mm-hmm. adult life, <laughs> except maybe with my kids at the, a board game at the kitchen table. Yeah. No. Um, So, uh, it was a great experience. I, uh, competed in, uh, women's physique, uh, which is a little different than like the girls that do bikini or figure and wear high heels. I, like I wanted to be on my feet and, uh, you know, like do all the poses or whatever it was. And I I mean, I was humble. I had a lot to learn. I was a, a a true novice, you know, is what they call it in the, in the world. But I did kind of resonate with what he said. I loved the level of discipline with like, I ate a ton of beef and eggs. So I did it completely ketogenic. 
um, a ton of, of ground beef and eggs, because that was easy for me to titrate, you know, the portions and things like that, um, and butter. And then, uh, you know, I don't know if I'll do it again. I, I kind of <laughs> got an itch. I kind of got an itch this year to maybe do it, but, uh, Robert told me, no, he said, you know, <laughs> you should take if it took you six months to train for it, you should take at least three times that off, which is 18 months. So now I'm, you know, my followers know I'm in a building phase. So now I'm trying to build as much muscle on my body as I can. Um, which is, you know, it's always, I think more enticing to like look lean and shredded, but you know, uh, for me, it's just how I function. So I'm in a, I'm in a building phase of trying to put some muscle on this body, which means I get to eat and I like eating. Yeah. <laughs> so he's going to, my husband's going to compete again this year. So I'll just awesome. get to watch from the sidelines. Yeah. Very cool. Well, congratulations on that. That's I mean, it's a huge accomplishment. Those take a ton of work and, uh, and dedication and, and, you know, they can be miserable. Like you say, thankfully you didn't have any of the hormonal issues that other people can get, but that just means that what you were doing, uh, was probably the right way to do it. So that's really good. Well, yeah. I mean, I think when you, when you think about, cause I mean, you're essentially titrating calories really low. So if you're going to be on a really calorie restricted diet, you know, the, the, the scientific question is, is it more advantageous to cut fat or cut carbs? Right. Mm -hmm. Because you want to keep protein really high. Everybody agrees. Um, and I think there are some advantages to keeping the fat higher and, and just cutting the carbs, um, from a hormonal preservation perspective, mm -hmm. um, a brain function perspective. Um, and I, yeah, I'm. I'm sold. I think, I think Robert's done an amazing thing and wrote an amazing book. So for anybody listening, you don't have to be a bodybuilder. You can, it's great advice for just being super fit and looking super fit and yeah. <laughs> functioning great. So, I mean, it's, it's, in, it's thorough. It is a thick book. So, um, go check that out for anybody that, that wants to learn more. Yeah, definitely. And, and for, for people watching, I've, you know, I've had, uh, Robert Sykes on, on the show as well and all his all that has details in his book and stuff like that are in the description there. But yeah, I agree. It's, um, it's, um, uh, I think that, that Robert's, you know, a lot of really, really good stuff and it was great talking to him as well and getting his insights in that. So I'm sure having him as a trainer was uh, pretty awesome. Yeah, it was. And then of course, now these days, you know, uh, steroids and performance enhancing drugs are the topic of conversation and, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, Robert's completely natural and he looks amazing mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I competed in a federation where people could use stuff and I showed up on show day and was like, oh yeah, oh, yeah I can't compete with that. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I only did that show because of the, the timing, like the way it worked mm. out, but there's natural federations that do like drug testing and, and those types of things. And, yeah. um, yeah, people have to be cautious about that because you can, you know, you only have so much natural genetic potential. And I think it's very enticing when people start competing to want to use these other substances to, mm. you know, be able to compete. Yeah. Or, or you can just eat, you know, massive amounts of raw liver apparently. And, uh, <laughs> like, yeah. and just it's totally, totally natural. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, Oops. exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, who, who, who didn't know that that was, that that was the case. I mean, that was yeah. a bit funny, you know, I think someone asked me, um, yesterday, like, what do you think about the revel revelation with liver King? And I was like, well, you know, the revelation to me was that people thought it was a revelation. I, I never thought yeah. that there was anything else going on. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, I think the right thing to do is to just, you know, admit it. And I think he actually did. I think I looked he did, this yeah. week or yesterday or something like that. And, um, you know, that's the thing is like, we just have to be honest humans and, uh, and, and we are humans, you know, I, a lot of people think like that I have some magic sauce over here. I mean, I said this in my book, listen, just cause I wear a white coat doesn't mean I know everything and I'm humble enough, um, you know, to admit when I'm wrong and to be very open-minded about things. And, you know, I'm, I'm more interested in, in what's right than about being right. And I think that's kind of the key message here is that, you know, you see these people on social media, but like, we're not perfect. Like we don't all sleep perfect. We don't, I've got fuse of bacterium nucleatum in my mouth, like, <laughs> you know, but we're on a, you know, we're on a path to trying to figure that out and, uh, for ourselves and for other people. And, um, you know, I think he does good things. I mean, he has mm -hmm. good messages for people. Unfortunately it got diluted, you know, That's by, it, yeah. by the fact that he wasn't honest. And, and like I said, hopefully he can admit it and move on and, uh, you know, continue to help people. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I, mean, I have nothing against that guy. I just thought it was, I honestly was surprised that people were surprised you know, really, because I didn't care one way or the other, you know, he was, he was doing this and he was, 
you know, you know, loud and gregarious. And, and that's what he was doing. And he was getting a lot of attention and it, you know, and that's exactly what he wanted to do, which is great. He did a very good job at that. And, uh, but yeah, he has, I, he has like done an apology and things like that. And, you know, I think that's, that is kind of the problem though, because he was so adamant about no, definitely not um, that it does, it does take away from the rest of it because people are going to sort of, you know, throw out everything else. And, you know, some people were even saying, um, I saw in like a lot of different comments and things like that, that um, they're like, well, is, you know, carnivore, you know, bullshit now too, is, is everyone just doing stuff and just not talking about it? And obviously, you know, he wasn't carnivore, but he ate a lot of meat and he, and he you know, espoused the, the benefits of eating uh, you know, meat and things like that. And so unfortunately, yeah, it does, it does uh, muddy the the message, but hopefully that can sort of be smoothed over and people can, you know, keep doing what's good for them. Yeah. 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 Um, speaking of which, uh, so what are you eating now? Um, just in your own normal daily life? So my, my diet has a lot of red meat and eggs. It, you know, through like different variations that that's always kind of maintained. We, we buy a cow every year. So, you know, from like feeding our family perspective, it's just most cost effective. We buy a cow. So we, we eat a lot of red meat. Um, I don't really eat chicken or turkey, uh, or any lean meats like that, but I love seafood. So we'll do you know, shrimp or scallops. Now I'm, I'm in Nebraska. I'm not near the ocean, <laughs> but, um, you can get some like wild caught salmon and shrimp and scallops. So we, we love seafood and we eat tons of eggs. Now I am not like hundred percent carnivore. So, you know, last night at dinner, I had some blackberries with my girls, you know, I'll have an occasional, you know, plant. I do love dairy, you know, so I'll have some cheese and, um, I'm dipping my toes in the water of starting to like make my own yogurt. Um, but my, I think my people would think my diet was very boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I eat a lot of the same things every single day. And honestly, that's what keeps me, you know, most consistent. And, um, when I stray from that ever, um, I feel it. Like I can tell that my brain doesn't function like over Thanksgiving. I had, you know, like a few foods that I wouldn't normally have. And like, ah, uh, just like, I can tell it just, it changes the way that I function. And for me, like, I have to be on every single day, you know, like I'm, I'm basically on call 365 days for my job. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do take vacations, but you know, I have to be on all the time and I have a full-time medical practice and I'm a mom of three and I do all these things. And people are always like, Oh my God, how do you do it? Well, the real answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I just do it. But I do think that because of the way that I take care of, care of myself and the way that I fuel myself, it allows me to work at another level. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think once people kind of realize that it makes sticking with this type of lifestyle, you know, I don't want to say easier because, you know, I used to be a pre-diabetic, you guys, like I ate half price Sonic milkshakes and cheese sticks, like through my pregnancy, like, um, you know, it's every day is like a recommitment to, you know, like living this way, but the food is delicious. I mean, when you're mm -hmm. eating with, you know, these healthy fats and butter and eggs and, you know, some bacon and lots of salt, like these foods are delicious. And um, I've been, you know, living through different evolutions of this diet since 2015. And, um, one thing has been pretty consistent over the last couple of years and that's, you know, beef and eggs. Yeah, definitely. And so would your family be pretty much eating the same thing? I know your, your husband may be doing something different for his prep, but, um, is he sort of doing the same thing and, and would your kids be eating the same way as well? Yeah. So he's like completely ketogenic, um, and uh, carnivore, um, for this prep. So, nice. um, nice. a lot of, you know, red meat, eggs, MCT oil, um, butter, uh, things like cream, things like that. Um, my kids. So basically, you know, whatever protein we have, if it's ground beef or eggs or whatever it is, they have that. And then they might have, you know, some berries or, you know, this morning, my daughter wanted an apple, you know, they might eat some other, you know, fruits or vegetables or things like that, that we might have around. Um, but, uh, they're super active kids and they're in sports and, you know, we try to limit, you know, sugar and sweets and things like that, but I'm also not the militant person. That's like, no, you can't have that. That's a bad thing for me with my children it's very much educational because at some point they're going to leave my house. And yeah. I don't want them to be like, mom, never let us have this. I'm going on the Taco Bell diet. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, for me, it's like teaching them how the food makes us feel what it does inside of our body. And like, 
let them screw up if they want to screw up. But it's like, you know, for a while, like in 2015, 2016, when my husband and I first were changing our diet, I didn't change theirs. So like I was making salmon for dinner and they were eating mac and cheese and they started to notice they're like, mom, why are you eating that? And I'm eating this. And I think as a mom and for other moms listening, like at the end of the day, when you come home and you're stressed and you don't know what to cook for dinner, like you just want everyone to eat dinner and not complain and just like move on. And I, I I resonate with that at the same time. Um, you should be like the example for your children. And I decided in 2018 that we were going to start to kind of change their diets. Let's get rid of some of these snacks and, you know, let's let them start participating in like the preparation of the food. Let's talk about like, you know, what the food does for us. And, um, I've been mind blown. I mean, like the first time, you know, that I made salmon or scallops or whatever, like they were eating these foods and they like these foods. My oldest daughter, Brecklin, I mean, she, the kid loves steak. If you're like, Hey, where do you want to go for your birthday? She picks the most expensive chop house in Omaha. Like the kid knows what like a good, like a good piece of meat is. And, um, that's been so cool. Cause that was not me when I was a little kid, I was like a carboholic. So, um, they, they love steak. They love beef. They love eggs, all the foods that we cook. And, but you know, they might have a few things here and here and their kids and they're going to be fine. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. I mean, it does, um, it does come back to bite you if you're, if you're too overbearing and then they're going to, they're going to want to, to go out the other way and just educating them because you're right. I mean, they're, you know, half the time they're out, out of the house at school or at friends, even when they're, they are living at home. And so as long as you've educated them and they, they know what to do and the right thing to do and what they want to do, and then they'll just do it on their own. Um, it's funny you say the Taco Bell diet. I was definitely on the Taco Bell diet in college. <laughs> I was, they had the, they had, uh, it was like 59 cent, um, soft tacos. And, uh, and you get, what was your thing it was like chalupas, gorditas, like crunch wrap supreme. <laughs> I, I, I always, I always wanted, I always wanted the meat. Right. And so like, oh. I found like the, like the best meat to, you know, uh, whatever tortilla ratio yeah. was like the soft tacos. And those are also the cheapest. And so you could get, there were 59 cents at soft taco and you could get a 10 pack for like $5, 550 or something like that. This is not, it's literally nothing. And so I get, I get 10 of these things and just like, just, just wolf them down. And um, yeah. And then there was, um, there was a burrito place that had these big, massive burritos just full of like, you know, chopped up steak and things like that. So like, I, I sort of just lived on that for a while, but it was actually, yeah. it, was, it was pretty meat heavy, but yeah, I've, I've, I've been on, I've been to the Taco Bell diet. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Not recommended but, long-term. No, 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 God, no. Um, great. Well, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I don't want to take um, too much of your time, but I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me today. It's been an absolute pleasure and very, very uh, interesting and educational. I hope everyone found that as well. I'm sure they did. Um, where can people find you and find your book? Yeah. So I have a website, drfitandfabulous.com, where you can find links to the book and my podcast. And I'm very active on social media, mostly on Instagram and Facebook. I've got I've got Twitter and TikTok, but I'll be real honest with you guys. I don't get on there. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm most active on Instagram. So uh, yeah, go check out the book if you're interested. And we've got an online academy that goes with it. But, you know, uh, Dr. Chafee, thank you for, you know, what you do and uh, for everybody listening, because, you know, with podcasts and things like these, you know, we rely on our followers and our listeners to disseminate this information and tell their friends and family. So thanks everybody for, you know, taking the time to tune in. Yeah. Very good point. And, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you to everybody. And, and hopefully you guys found this helpful and can pass it on to someone who would also find it helpful and useful. I think there's a lot of really, really important information there, especially for people trying to get, get, um, pregnant and, um, have a, a successful pregnancy and uh, young family. So thank you very much for, for all of that. Thank you. Welcome.